Welcome back to the Deliberate Leaders Podcast. I am your host and executive coach, Allison Dunn. Today, our guest here with us is Jennifer Brown, and our topic is inclusive leadership. Jennifer is an award-winning thought leader, speaker, and author of How to Be an Inclusive Leader. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. I like to kick these off with a deliberate conversation. What would be your number one leadership tip for our listeners today? Mm. Well, the definition of leadership is changing and it's a change or die threshold moment. I think for most leaders, particularly those of a certain generation who may, as I predict and have experienced, be struggling more with what's being asked of us and specific to my topic, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, it's a new, it's a new language. It's a new terrain. Um, it's a new comfort level or discomfort level. I would say the sort of unprecedented levels of discomfort. And for many leaders that I work with, it probably feels like you're working without a net or a script, you know, it's, it's, it's changing so fast. What is being expected of us? And really we're only leaders if we can meet what is being expected of us, not necessarily what we were always good at, right? It's to me, good leadership is responsive leadership. And as such, it, it is grounded and needs to be grounded in what is needed of us in the situation. And that, that is what has shifted and continues to shift so, so massively. Um, I, I very much agree. Um, let's kind of dive into, um, maybe building the traits around what leaders must have in order to be able to adopt and be more inclusive. Um, what, 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 um, what would that look like? Um, yeah, that, well, that's, that is the, that's the big question, right? Sort of what does good look like? What does success look like? And so remember going back to understanding what has been incentivized, rewarded, trained on, um, normed in organizations, it's command and control. It's leaders who have all the answers. It's leaders who sort of are this like courageous guru guiding everybody through the storm, you know, and we're all in the storm, <laughs> including leaders and maybe even mostly leaders, uh, you know, back to my point about generations, this is a very hard fraught moment. I think for people who are the most at sea about what is needed, well, how do I show up? Well, you know, how, how, what can I do that resonates? What can I do that wins the trust of others when the very definition has changed? Um, so the attributes then are things like vulnerability to that point, humility. I don't have the answers, but we're, we're learning together. And here's how I'm learning um, transparency about um, how, you know, the math of me, you know, how the, how it's happening, how the sausage is being made, you know, whatever metaphor we want to use, but the, we are all becoming, you know, and I, I think leaders at any stage are continuing to have to evolve so that the agility and the comfort with change and uncertainty and the ability to show up authentically in the midst of that and win trust, but not through having all the answers and being like necessarily the most competent and confident, but the most real, the most complete, the most um, whole. Um, I just think that we've leaders, leaders, and this hasn't been, hasn't been good for the mental health of leaders either, by the way, is sort of needing to just show up with certain parts of who they are. I don't think that's been terribly healthy. Um, we have buried a lot of things that are true about us. We have not you know, um, been maybe courageous enough to step outside the norms of leadership and say, well, this, I'm not comfortable with this. I'm not comfortable with this behavior. I'm not comfortable with, you know, I don't have all the answers, but there's not been a lot of room, I think for that kind of leadership, particularly if leadership as it is, is dominated by men, um, at the top of the many organizations. Um, there are, I think, gendered expectations and norms and, and that narrowness of, how do I get to show up in all of my true self? There hasn't been a lot of room for that for anybody of any identity. So we are in the midst of a wholesale change. And I think those of us who come out of this will not only sort of, will not spend our time, our precious time questioning, you know, why do I need to change? You know, I wasn't raised this way. I wasn't led this way. You know, I didn't, you know, that hasn't gotten me to, to where I am. Right. It, it kind of, to me, it doesn't matter. 
It doesn't matter because it's changing, whether we like it or not, whether we agree with it or not, whether it aligns with our politics or not. To me, good leadership is inclusive leadership. And um, whatever we happen to believe, we can sort of put that aside and say, well, what is being expected of me so that I can get the job done innovatively? How, How can I get the job done with trust, not breaking trust? You know, how can I get to where we want to go um, without changing? There's no way you can. So that's the invitation. Um, what do you, what would you say are some of the challenges that leaders are facing on their road to trying to learn and understand how to be an inclusive leader? Mm-mm-mm. Well, the ego is the first thing that comes to mind. The ego is so strong and has, you know, protected us and um, has told us who we think you know, who we think we are, you know, and has been fed by what we've been praised for and encouraged to be and rewarded for monetarily and otherwise recognition. So, um, I think the ego of, I know the answers, um, I have to show up a certain way. I have to protect myself. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a good person. And therefore like, I, Oh, I've got this, you know, (laughs) Oh, I'm good at this. Oh, I'm great at this. That stuff, um, sort of prevents the inquiry, like the humble inquiry and the curiosity that I was talking about before in terms of the definition of inclusive leadership. Um, because, because you cannot do this well without being humble to the fact that you don't know what you don't know. And as then you wake up, you realize, oh, I know what I don't know. And you kind of progress from there. Um, But there is so much you can't know, uh, which gets to the concept of allyship, which we can talk about if you'd like, but you know, that, that, yeah, that, that is a really key piece. So I'll put a little pin on that. (laughs) Okay. Um, I, you know, I believe like, uh, that, um, diversity and inclusion and equality are um, at multi-levels within an organization. So, you know, from your perspective and research, you know, what, um, what can our other levels, our entry levels, our mid levels do to assist and provide, um, and foster inclusion in our cultures? Yeah. Well, you're always leading. If you're in any context, you're even leading yourself. I was just going to say, if you're in a context with one other person, (laughs) there's a leadership opportunity. Um, And when we say inclusive leadership, we do mean allyship, I think, which is the ability to the skill of removing your, your lens, like the lens of how you've grown up and really incorporating what you've learned and are learning about other people's experience. And you acknowledge and believe that their experience can be exactly the same, different, different in exactly the same situation Mm -hmm. because it's filtered through people's identities, right? They're visible and invisible Mm -hmm. identities. So, um, so at any level you can be being an, an inclusive colleague, you can be pointing out biases and microaggressions in yourself and others. You can be, checking in with somebody to investigate how they may be struggling with belonging in a given system, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, whether their identity is interrupting their ability to thrive based on how they're treated and how they, and how they see themselves. You know, I, I think I always come back to my generation was told to say, I don't see color. And we thought that was equality, right? We thought that was the work. And maybe back then, maybe it was, I don't think so because it erased the differences that are making a difference for other, for people, for all of us in some way or another every day and difference. Now the conversation difference is something we need to talk about, remark on, make room for, um, acknowledge, but we have to do this interestingly without tokenizing people at the same time. So it's really this, it's like you know, this threading the needle opportunity, again, another thing that conclusive leaders do well, which is to figure out how do I, how do I anticipate and know in my heart and my head that bias is real, that folks are having a different experience in the same system. Mm -hmm. And how do I make room to address that? How do I hold myself accountable to move that along? Um, And I believe you can do that even when you don't have you know, people reporting to you, I believe you can do this even upwards in the organizational hierarchy. You can have a conversation with a manager or a leader to give them feedback about something that impacts 
either yourself or someone else. Um, I think that that conversation can be had. It needs skill for sure. And a lot of compassion, we say safe space and grace, grace for ourselves and our, in our learning grace for others and their learning space to learn and change and grow. And I might add, you know, compassion for what people don't know that they don't know, um, as they awaken to that. So, um, I think we can, we can influence in a 360 degree way, anywhere we are in the organization. And if you are somebody of relatively more privileges, you can come from this place of allyship, which is to say an acknowledgement of the system works for me in certain ways. I feel comfortable here. I am part of that norm. Um, and, and then I can acknowledge that others maybe aren't. And then I have to question myself, how am I utilizing my insider status to influence the system for the better? And that's a wonderful sort of, I, I think it's a very alive place to come from. Uh, and, and it's the opposite of, oh, Jennifer, I don't know what to do. I can't do anything. I'm just, I'm going to stay away from this. Right. <laughs> Cause that's what we don't, that's what we don't want. <laughs> right. Um, I, I would sense that, um, a lot of people probably feel, um, like they're part of the, part of the norm and I, mm. you know, unfairly, fairly, I don't know what that would be. Um, how, how can someone who might feel like they're part of the norm recognize when that's the time that they need to recognize? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Like it's a question of how do you sense the water you're swimming in, right? It's yeah. so comfortable. It's what you're, what all, you know, it's right. all, you know, it is what, you know, that is right. That is right. And it, as such, it's invisible. It's hard to step away from it and see it like mm-hmm. really see it. Um, you know, I would just ask folks to think about like all of the, uh, you know, I define diversity so much broader than just race and gender. It is socioeconomic. It is. Um, the presence or the lack of mental health challenges. It is caregiving or not having to care give. Mm -hmm. It can be um, uh, not, you know, parenting in a pandemic, you know, because you don't have human children. (laughs) So there are, there are um, the ways that some of us are riding through the storm in a better boat, you know, than someone else and the ability to discern Whether you were born with it or not is to me, not very important Mm -hmm. because either way you have access to it now, you know, I mean, I have, I have certain earned privileges, but then I have like inborn that allow me to walk through the world and feel less in danger, right? Less afraid of violence, for example. And I'm in the LGBTQ community and yet there are other identities that I carry that protect me in that identity, protect me because I'm also white, I'm also cisgender, right? I'm, my gender presentation doesn't cause, you know, questioning comments, the potential of violence. I mean, so when you start to really pull out and say, um, I might, I might have experienced marginalization, you know, because I'm a female, for example, in, you know, male dominated world, that's one piece, but um, you know, there's, there's so many, so many other ways that I've been kind of, you know, sped along in ways that I haven't been even been aware of or appreciated. And then, and then the next piece of course, is to say, who hasn't had that wind at their back, who hasn't been protected, who's been vulnerable and had to struggle, um, differently. And I, and if we just kind of start there and just begin to notice, <laughs> I, I, I would imagine you'll begin to notice, you know, the, the parts of your life that um, have gone easier for you and where the system has been built for you. So to work for you and, and then to just begin to educate yourself about, you know, that very same system as it hasn't worked for others. And then, and then say, okay, so how can I then influence and put my shoulder to the wheel in that system to brought, to open, to pry open that door to change, you know, to become more welcoming, to broaden those HR policies, to challenge, you know, I don't know, a statement or a language in my company's uh, website or, or, you know, commitments statements, you know, how can I, I don't know, how can I, if I'm in the room and nobody else is that can speak for their experience, how can I be, how can I know enough to speak? Um, That's, 
that's where I always challenge myself. I even say to myself, is my voice needed? You know, where specifically is my voice needed and where do I need to make sure other I'm making room for other voices? That's a discipline and a habit that you can build over time where every room then that you're in, you're noticing who's speaking, who's dominant, who gets the most attention, you know, who gets the sort of most sort of maybe unearned credit because of their degrees or where they went to school or who they know. You know, when you begin to sensitize yourself to this, you start to see challenges everywhere. And there's a lot of opportunity to choose where you want to intervene and begin to agitate. <laughs> That's, That's the word. Good word. <laughs> That is a good word. Um, Jennifer, would you share um, some concrete steps that individuals can take um, to help drive positive change? Mm -hmm. Well, we have to start with ourselves, I think. So I have a four part, um, four stage model, a growth model in my book, and it goes from unaware to aware, to active, to advocate. And there are four stages that I've named it's so important to know where we are and we can be in a lot of different places. I can be pretty advanced in certain identities because I know them or I have a kid who identifies a certain way. And I have sort of been thrown into the deep end of the pool and had to, had no choice. Right. But then in other cases, there's, I'm, I'm a beginner learner. So I think that's important to know where we are so that we can take that right next step. And then if we're in the beginning stages, it's about exposure to more information. I think it's more, more Ted talks, you know, by people whose identity you don't share uh, more trainings and webinars, more consumption of media made by and for and about different identities than yours. We, we tend to kind of stay in our bubble and be comfortable in that way because it's more comfortable for humans to be around sameness. So I think this is something we have to kind of practice and, and have a discipline around, um, even so far as like every week, you know, saying, who am I spending time with? Um, is it the same usual people? Do we share the same background, education, community, neighborhoods, communities of faith, you know, whatever it is, um, and, and, and pushing against that. I think that's what we do, what we need to do. But then once we increase our awareness and kind of broaden the aperture, so to speak, then the question becomes, well, what am I doing differently? I've been learning and absorbing, but now I need to act. I need to take it and, and act. And action then is, you know, I'm, I'm going to commit to, you know, diversifying my network of people. Um, I've never known a person that identifies this way. I've, you know, I'm going to begin as, as a leader at any level to speak about things for the first time, maybe begin to share a diversity dimension that I experience, or maybe talk about how the system, you know, I realize my privileges. Um, that's a very powerful thing for people to do. It can feel very risky, but I hope we come to a day someday where somebody like me can be, and, and, and anybody can talk about the different puzzle pieces that make them who they are without fear. And, and, and part of that is how have I had this wind at my back? Like how have I benefited, but how do I acknowledge that? How, and what am I doing with it? How am I using it? Whatever credibility, authority, seniority, um, in, inside information, um, my network, you know, how am I using that to shift things? Um, not taking it for granted and not sitting back and not benefiting from it without actually turning around and using it. Because I think that's why it's given to us. Like, you know, I, 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 I don't know, like, why are some of us safer in the world? What is that? What responsibility does that bring with it? You know, I think it brings the, the, the opportunity to, to better and to leave a different legacy so that others perhaps don't need to struggle. Um, but it's, it's this beautiful way of paying it forward, I think. I think of it that way, leaving it better than we found it and, and really paying back what we've been given in the world, which has made our lives easier. Um, so, yep, I think that, that it depends, again, back to where you are, dictates that next step. If you already feel like you, you've learned and studied and and you're kind of ready to take it on the road, then you're going to begin to apply and speak and have new conversations and seek out different. And it's not always going to go smoothly and it's not going to be comfortable. Um, a lot of this means getting very uncomfortable. 
Sometimes we read things that challenge us. You know, sometimes we have a difficult conversation um, or we get, we're given feedback maybe about how we're not being inclusive and we react badly. Um, our ego gets involved. We want to protect ourselves. We want to deny what we're hearing, you know, all that stuff. Um, that's part of growth. So, you know, I think that that um, all I can say is, you know, be open yourself up to this process. And um, if you can weather some of the bumps and see the learning for what it is, that it is actually bettering you, that it is changing you, that it is shaping you for the future. I think we can come to this place where we're very grateful actually to have the opportunity to, to grow and evolve in this way and look at it as that, as opposed to, oh, this is scary. I don't want to do it. I'm avoiding it. I'm a, I'm afraid I'm a bad, you know, I'm being told I'm a bad person. It's actually, it's not any of that. It's an opportunity to change and change is never, change is not comfortable. And yet imagine what's on the other side of having developed a new a new practice for yourself. Um, think about saving money, eating better, say, staying in shape. Any discipline that we have that we're grateful that we have was difficult to develop in the beginning. And I and I would just have some have some self compassion that it's going to feel like that until you get the hang of it. Um, I appreciate you um, actually putting it in that light of that we do develop positive good habits for growth and learning and health and yeah. wealth and like everything else, and this should be part of the pie, right? Right. Exactly. Um, I hope that you're okay. If I personally put you on the spot in yeah. the sense of, I think it would be, um, it would be valuable to understand that the stages that you're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. and I love the concept of paying it forward, um, changing, um, the legacy of, you know, the way things have always been, what one thing are you focusing on this quarter, this year, this week, this month? Mm, 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 mm. Well, um, so as a firm who focuses in this and as a, an individual who's been focusing on, um, things like race and ethnicity, I've been deep, deep, deep in, um, but I would say certain ethnicities, I wouldn't say that I am, I'm, I'm equally deep on identities that are non-white I'd say. Yeah. So, you know, I would give myself varying scores, uh, depending on that. And, um, so that's that. And then LGBTQ, of course, in we, even within my technically my community of identity, there are identities mm -hmm. within that, that I don't, that I don't know as much as I would like to know about. So okay. I'm constantly challenging myself to make sure I'm inclusive of that and not letting myself off the hook, even though I'm in technically in a community, doesn't mean that you understand everything about that community. Um, and then I would say, goodness, ugh, so many learning frontiers for me. Um, and there, there are a lot of the things that I don't carry myself, caregiving, parenting, mental health, um, neurodiversity, mm -hmm. um, disability, mm -hmm. hidden, hidden disabilities, visible disabilities, um, veteran status. It's, it's just incredible to dig into some of these identities and, and, and come to know that one person that is your first kind of teacher about it. And you listen to them and you read their books or, you know, I, in my case, I get to have them on my podcast and learn that way. But I, I am so those conversations make a, a permanent mark for me. And I always will carry their stories with me, the statistics that they share, the, the, the window into their world. Um, and the, and the empathy and the compassion that is ignited in me when I hear, when I am witness to, and somebody trusts me with that information, I feel very humbled by it. I feel honored by it. And I feel it's a very sacred moment that is mine not to forget. And also mine to carry and educate others about. So yeah. So I would say those are some of my, my learning edges. And, and this is very typical, by the way, for everybody listening, the things that you don't have proximity to the things that you don't carry, the things that you don't have in your family. Um, you know, these are the things that are going to be more foreign and yet, um, so worthy, so worthy of investment of time and heart. And then, and then what we do with it is we carry it forward and we bring it into rooms where that discussion isn't happening, where that information isn't being shared. That is to me, the core of allyship. Um, so I kind of 
you know, I have like 12 grades, I guess I would, I would give myself along some of the identities that I just mentioned. And I, and that's how kind of how I would recommend people do it, you know, is kind of think about, think about where you want to focus, set some goals, maybe make a month or a quarter all about a certain arena that you want to get deeper in and set some goals for yourself in terms of reading, listening, information, research, and statistics, knowing people in that community, hearing the stories and sharing wherever you can. And I think that's a, it's a wonderful way to progress Mm -hmm. Um, because we're never done. The work is not about a destination. It is like literally like digging into the journey and like enjoying every piece of it and, and figuring out how you can use it. Fantastic. Um, I, I like kind of the specific steps that people could take away from, from listening to this and um, implement that. Right. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us here today. I very much appreciated our conversation. Oh, thanks for having me. You bet. 